Good morning. Let's try it again. Good morning. There we go. Um, I've been away for two weeks, so that means I haven't been preaching for two weeks. So uh, we're going to be here for a while, okay? <laughs> been saving it up. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, today we walk into the garden beside the tree in the garden of Gethsemane, that holy place, the holy of holies, where few have gone. We, we feel like Moses before the burning bush. We hear the angels saying, take off your shoes for the place where on you are standing is holy ground. We hear Isaiah crying, holy, holy, holy. We are not worthy to take this journey among the olive trees. We take each step thoughtfully, reverently, and cautiously. If by your glory we are consumed, we are confident, we are not doomed. We have been granted mercy. We feel as though we should travel through this text on our knees. So Father, our hearts are bowed. Bring us in. Amen. Spurgeon said this journey to the cross through the garden is worthy of an angel's tongue. And I hate to break it to you, but you don't have an angel. You have me. And I'm woefully inadequate to expound such things. The general theme of chapter 22 is the abandonment of Jesus. This passage is dripping with abandonment. The religious leaders abandon Jesus. Judas abandons Jesus. Peter abandons Jesus. You don't see it in this account, but in Mark's garden account, you have a record of a young man following Jesus into the garden. He's only wearing a coat. The captors tried to grab him as they grabbed Christ, but they could only grab his coat, and he fled away naked. This is the, the first re record of a streaker in the Bible. Pretty sure he was a college student. <laughs> Jesus was even abandoned by the streaker. Actually, some scholars believe that it was Mark, the author of that gospel record, and that's how he was identifying himself. We're not sure, but we are sure of this. All of Jesus' friends abandoned him. And more than all of that, he is abandoned by God. There are two movements in the text that flow naturally from the paragraph divisions. We have a garden cup and a garden kiss. First, a garden cup. Previously, on a rooftop, Jesus instituted what we call the Lord's table. He also warns of a betrayer. He washes the disciples' feet. Now the 11 disciples follow Jesus down the stairs across the gloomy brook Kidron. It's dark, essentially no light anywhere. As they walk in the night, branches crack under their feet. And they arrive at the Mount of Olives. Some of the richest residents owned private gardens on the Mount of Olives. They built beautiful stone walls around the private acres where they could rest and relax. Evidently, Jesus had a wealthy friend who had offered him a place to rest and pray among the gnarled olive trees. Luke lacks mention of Gethsemane, but comparing scripture with scripture, we know that Gethsemane is among the olives. Notice verse 39. Jesus came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. Crossing the valley and climbing the hill in the darkness became a regular routine for Christ, his habit, his as usual. It's been the prayer closet of Jesus the entire week of Passover. Once he arrives, we know from other gospel record accounts that Jesus tells eight disciples to wait outside the garden entrance and they are to keep watch. He takes Peter, James, and John, the inner circle, the privileged three, deeper with him into the garden. And then he withdraws a stone's throw because he must tread this wine press alone. Verse 41 says that he knelt down and prayed. So don't picture the Tim Tebow bow. With, with one knee down, one knee up, helmet on the ground. Our historical pictures and paintings of Jesus in the garden are far too serene. We imagine him in the garden praying rather stoically. But the mood of Gethsemane was anything but tranquil. 
Mark 14 says he went a little further and then he fell down and prayed. He went a little further and then he fell down to the ground. So this is the imperfect tense, the verb. And it could be read, he fell to the ground and prayed. He got up, he went a little further and he fell to the ground and prayed. He picked himself up, staggered a few more steps and fell to the ground and prayed. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 7 adds to this. He did this with loud crying and tears. These three men are seeing and hearing Jesus lying flat on the ground, violently sobbing. And let's eavesdrop. Let's eavesdrop on this conversation. What is being said in this sacred moment? Verse 42. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Notice the prayer begins with the word Father. Understand that nowhere, not in the Old Testament or any other document prior to Jesus Christ coming to earth, does any individual Israelite ever address God as Father. He's referred to as the Father of the nation of Israel, Deuteronomy 22, Malachi 1, Jeremiah 3. But an individual man praying to God and calling him Father? Staggering. For Jesus, Father was his favorite term for addressing God. We find it on his lips over 100 times. Jesus actually commands us to do the same. When you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven. Calvin said, Father, that's baby talk. That's son talk. And here's something interesting. The only time Jesus ever prayed where he did not refer to God as Father was when he hung on the cross and he cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He did not call him Father then. Why? Because in that moment, Jesus became our sin, which caused intimacy with the Father to be abandoned. No baby talk on the cross because the Son became sin and the wrath of God was poured out. Jesus prayed, Father, remove the cup. What's in the cup? And why didn't Jesus want to drink it? It, it couldn't have been Tim Horton's coffee because that's excellent. And if you're ranking coffees, it, it couldn't have been number two on the list, Dunkin' Donuts coffee. Couldn't have been that. It, it, maybe it was number 465, Starbucks. Maybe it was Starbucks in the cup. Or, or number 464, motor oil. Maybe it was motor oil in the cup. Theologians give us a couple different options. Some say it was death in the cup. Jesus didn't want to die this way. That's what John Piper believes. That it was the totality of the 18 hours that Jesus was about to face. Others believe it was depression in the cup. Charles Spurgeon believed it was a dreadful depression of mind which had suddenly come upon Christ so that his soul was very heavy. Spurgeon struggled with depression so it's, it's no surprise here that this would be his view. The third view is the view which I hold is that the wrath of God toward the sin of man was in the cup. The Bible symbolizes God's wrath as a cup full of strong, destructive drink. Jesus is holding the worst drink a man could drink. Spiritual poison. The cup contains God's righteous fury against the sins of the world for all time. In that cup was the payment for sins. Payment for the Assyrians who, who skinned alive Jesus' own people. And, and the Nazi SS troops who raped women and gunned down playful children. Who tied American POWs to a pole naked and then released vicious dogs to castrate them. As Jesus stirs the cup, he sees fathers beating beating their children with a belt. Pimps seducing an 11-year-old girl and then forcing her into prostitution. Canaanites burning their children as a sacrifice to Moloch. The sins of gangsters, 
to bullies, sadistic sins to silly sins, like gossip. This cup was worse than Nebuchadnezzar's fiery furnace, worse than Daniel's lion's den. What did he see when he looked in the cup? He saw your face. He saw your sin. And how your sins offended a holy God. Medieval theologian Anselm said, You have not yet considered the seriousness of your sin. May the cup help you do that. Jesus looked in the cup and he saw hell open before him rather than heaven. And he staggered. Jesus pushes the cup to the side and he pleads with the Father. He's not saying, let's, let's abort the mission. Kevin DeYoung says Jesus is asking, if there is any other way of saving your people that doesn't involve me drinking your wrath. And, and what did the Father say to him? Nothing. Though the Son of God prayed God the Father returns silence from heaven. The prayer that saves sinners was actually a prayer denied. The Father said no to Jesus in order to say yes to you. We tend to think of God's plan and our lives being accomplished by his saying yes to us. But here, with his only son, the Father accomplishes our salvation by saying no. Praise his holy name for saying no. Our greatest deliverance came from an unanswered prayer. Verse 43. There appeared to Jesus an angel from heaven, strengthening him. How did the angel strengthen him? Did he, did he give him a John Piper book and say, this is what you need in the garden? Did he give him a, a big mouth Billy the Bass? You remember those? They, they'd hang on the wall. It was, a, it was a fish. It would sing. Here's a little song I wrote. You might want to sing it note for note. Be happy. Don't worry. Be happy. Is that? No? I don't think so. Although if you have one of those, I'd like to have it. Brings back childhood memories. Jesus created this angel. How could the creator receive strength from his creation? Why would God, who is infinitely powerful, need an angel who is limited in power to strengthen him? And church, I'm going to be honest. I can't get rid of the mystery here. But hopefully I can lead you to worship in the mystery. Luke goes out of his way to portray Jesus' humanity. And that's why he records other events that no one else records, like, like being 12 and left at the temple. Angelic aid has roots in the Old Testament. You see it in 1 Kings 19, Daniel chapter 3, Daniel chapter 10... Uh, Psalm 91, the strengthening role of an angel is like that of a trainer who readies an athlete. There are actually only two times between Jesus' birth and his resurrection where an angel appears to him. The first was his temptation in the wilderness. The second was his temptation in the garden. The angel hears Christ praying and sees Christ crying and he leaves the courts of heaven to be with his creator. And he does not leave because he needs to be redeemed. He's not thinking, well, maybe if, maybe if Jesus doesn't go through with this, then I'm going to go to hell. No. Angels have no sin. They don't need Jesus to die for them to be redeemed. Jesus created angels sinless. So the angel didn't whisper, Jesus, do this for me. Nor did the angel whisper, Jesus, just sit back. I'll take it from here. I'll finish your course. The angel stood to strengthen, not to fight. For this battle, Christ must fight alone. However, the angel did whisper. He did strengthen. The angel affirmed the Father's love. The angel whispered, this is the way. There is no other way. The angel reminded that same Satan who is tormenting you will soon endure everlasting judgment. Jesus, you will reign from sea to sea, and there is no equal. Perhaps he painted a, a mental picture of chariots coming down from on high to bear this King Jesus to his throne. Whatever the angel did, whatever the angel said, he placed ointment on the oppressed champion who was ready to faint. 
And he, our great deliverer, received strength from on high. And he rose to fight his last fight. Verse 44. And being in agony, Jesus prayed more earnestly. It is impossible to exaggerate the depth of Jesus' anguish in the garden. He had an anguish of spirit, soul, and body. He had spirit agony. This is the inner sanctum of his suffering. William Lane's commentary says that God had already began to turn his face away from the sun. He was facing God forsakenness. No one could by any possibility gaze upon these veiled mysteries of what the spirit endured. There was spirit agony, but there was also soul agony. Martin Luther said, no one feared death like this man. Why? Because he's enduring something greater than physical torture. He's experiencing a soul forsakenness. We can buy paintings that picture his time in the garden, even produce movies detailing it, but nothing can show his soul suffering. You cannot really enter in. And I ask the question, why would Jesus go through this spirit agony, this soul agony? The lover of our souls had nothing to gain except to redeem our souls from sin and win our hearts for himself. And then there was a body agony. Jesus had a sinless distaste for pain. Keyword, sinless. Don't ever forget, Jesus Christ is not an actor trying to play the part, trying to feel what a human being would feel at this moment. While he is 100% divine, he is also 100% human. He is experiencing bodily pain. Luke mentions blood. It's actually unique to his gospel record. And that's, that's no, no surprise since he's a medical doctor. Notice verse 44. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. There's two takes on this verse. Uh, the first one is the one I hold to, that the sweat became so profuse that it flowed to the ground as fle freely as it were drops of blood. The word like in the scriptures is always... Um, metaphorical unless it refers to time so I, I think the blood and sweat event is metaphorical not a description of Jesus sweating blood however R.C. Sproul and Kevin DeYoung disagree with me they believe that Jesus literally sweated blood the medical community calls this hematidrosis under intense pressure or fear, the blood vessels around the sweat glands contract and then dilate violently, causing them to rupture. Blood then enters the glands and is secreted through the pores of the skin. And if this is what happened, it is fitting that because this is not the only time that droplets of blood will fall from his body onto the ground. There is coming a crimson tide. His blood will fall to the ground, fertilize earth's soil, and will soon deliver it from the curse by becoming the curse. There is an old hymn written in 1791. It says, The powers of hell united pressed and squeezed his heart and bruised his breast. What dreadful conflicts raged within when sweat and blood forced through his skin. Oh, the love of Jesus. And all oh, the weight of sin. And all oh, the debt of gratitude which you and I owe to him. Were, were the whole realm of nature mine. That were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine. Demands my soul, my life, my all. Do you see now what an attack it is to say that there are multiple ways to heaven? What an insult to Jesus Christ to say that Islam and Hindu... And your morality-soaked sweat will lead you to God. The sinless sweat that dropped onto the cold, frosty, moonlit soil is the only way to God. Either Jesus bottomed the cup that contained the wrath of God for your sins, or you will bottom the cup. Verse 45, when Jesus rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. It's almost comical. Sleeping for sorrow. Jesus rolls up on the disciples and they're snoring loudly, mouth open, drooling. 
Jesus wakes them up. Maybe he pours some water on them. Maybe he did what my parents used to do to us. Put a little shaving cream in your hands. Tickle with a feather your face. And then you do this and we don't know. Luke compacts the narrative and focuses us in on specific events for specific purposes. But other gospel record writers tell us that Jesus went to the three, di three disciples three separate times, finding them asleep each time. So imagine this scene. This, this is not hippie, hacky sack Jesus with a perm and a warm glow walking up to the sleeping disciples. The bloodied face of Jesus peers on these sleeping followers. And it's okay. Because what will redeem them isn't how they perform in the garden, but how Jesus performs for them in the garden. They are sleeping for sorrow. And I think this is often what we miss in the garden. Jesus' pending death has struck home and has emotionally drained the disciples. They are passed out from heartbreak. They are drugged by grief. And as Jesus stands looking, there are no doubt olive leaves all around his feet. And that's significant. The first time we see an olive leaf in scripture is after the, the flood when Noah released a dove and brought back a branch and it had an olive leaf on it. The dove all throughout the Bible pictures peace and so does the olive leaf. On the boat, after the flood of wrath, there was peace. And in the garden, after another flood of wrath, Jesus stands to give ultimate peace. With peace at his feet. He turns a mountain of war into a mountain of peace. Jesus brings peace to the battle garden. So we have a garden cup. And then we have a garden kiss. Notice verse 47. While Jesus was still speaking, there came a crowd and a man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to, to kiss him. Judas had intimate knowledge of the Lord's routine. He knew the Lord liked to retreat to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus has been quite busy since he left the upper room in that Palestinian house. He, he had to find the leader of the chief priest and he told them, it's time. One guy went to tell another guy. They began the first century version of a call tree, getting men out of bed, knocking. It's going down tonight. Get on some clothes. Meet us at the rallying point. He had to convince Roman soldiers to believe that Jesus was an insurrectionist. And that night, those cobblestone roads were thick with people carrying clubs like nightsticks in one hand and torches in the other. Judas hurries up to the hillside toward Gethsemane with 600 Roman soldiers, temple police, and a mob of others who had come in the night. John MacArthur believes it could have been upward of 1,000 people rushing the garden. Verse 48, Jesus said to them, Judas... Would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Someone asked me about a month ago, why would it be necessary to identify Jesus with a kiss? Especially if he was so well known in the area. Didn't everyone know him? Well, it could be that it was dark and they could not see well despite their torches so a kiss would identify the Christ. Or perhaps Judas approached first and the rest followed behind so that they could surround Jesus immediately upon the signal. Perhaps the armed soldiers knew who Je didn't know who Jesus was, so they needed a signal. Jesus, Judas used the ultimate gesture, a kiss, to betray the Lord. Think of things that we communicate with a kiss. A couple signifies marriage with a kiss. A married couple communicates their love with a kiss on the lips and their romance with a kiss on the neck. Kissing a person's hand may communicate admiration or respect. Many cultures communicate friendship with a kiss on the cheek. And that would have been true of this culture. The early church was encouraged to greet one another with a holy kiss. And here's the thing. No matter how you kiss, the kiss always symbolized something good. And it wasn't until Judas kissed our Lord that betrayal became associated with a kiss. 
He exploits the greeting of friendship and loyalty. The phrase in English, the kiss of death, comes from this passage. It's ultimately a goodbye kiss. It's interesting to me that Jesus isn't ultimately destroyed by this kiss. Satan is. And who was this Judas after all? There's an old view and there's a new view. The old view says he's the most diabolical person to ever walk on the planet. He's more wicked and evil than anyone in history. In, in Dante's Inferno, you'll remember Dante pictured the lowest level of hell under a sheet of ice in which the worst sinners were eaten alive by Satan. And one of them was Judas. Dante portrays Judas as one of the three worst sinners who ever lived. That's the old view. But then there's the new view. The new view says Judas was in on the plan. In this view, Judas comes across as the only disciple who really gets it. In the movie, The Last Temptation of Christ, it shows Judas as obeying Jesus' covert request to help him fulfill his destiny to die on the cross. Making Judas the catalyst for Jesus' saving work on the cross. Not the enemy. So which is it? Is Judas the vilest human being who ever lived or is he actually the hero behind the scenes? I think the answer is neither. Judas is just like you. Or maybe it'd be better to say you are just like him. Does that offend you? It offends me. I'd much rather see Judas as a monster rather than to see myself as a potential Judas. Judas was willing to follow Jesus when it benefited him. And when following Jesus cost him, Judas was willing to sell Jesus out. In verse 49, the disciples see the mob coming. They know what's happening. They ask Jesus, Lord, shall we strike with a sword? And without waiting for an answer, notice what they did in verse 15. Verse 50, and one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. <laughs> At this point, the disciples are, are like Tupac. Ride or die. You're with us or you're against us. And I like what Leon's Crump says. If your first reaction in a scrape is to cut a man's ear off, then chances are you've done that before. Only John notes that it was Peter that cut the ear off of this man. He took one of their only two swords, remember three weeks ago when he says, when they said, God, we only have two swords. And he said, it is enough. So he took one of those two swords and he sliced his ear like you would slice a piece of bread. Verse 51, Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Imagine seeing that. Here, here's a good question. Why didn't everyone who came to arrest Jesus just stop in their tracks and change their minds? We know from John's account that Jesus said, are you looking for Jesus of Nazareth? They said, yes. And he said, I am. And when he said, I am, the earth shook and everyone fell to the ground, leaving the Son of Man, the last one standing. I mean, at least the earless guy should have changed his mind. I don't care what's going on. I am going to join forces with the guy who just put my ear back on my head. But it's dark. And it's more than just physically dark in the garden. It's spiritually dark in the garden. People can't see. Verse 52, Jesus said to the chief priests, notice the three groups, officers of the temple and the elders who had come out against him, have you come out against me as a robber with swords and clubs? Jesus says, you're, you're coming at me like I'm Al Capone. Why all the backup? I've never been a man of war. There were three groups of people, chief priests, temple officers, and elders. In other words, the religious, the military, and the civil leadership are all present. And in verse uh, 53b, Jesus says, this is your hour and the power of darkness. Satan thinks he has conquered the Son of God. What he has really done is become a pawn to complete the plan of God. Even cowardness and abandonment are made to do God's bidding. The power of darkness has the upper hand now, but it will only last for an hour. You have this hour because I gave you this hour. And it's only a brief time. And it's only for my purpose. 
You're playing checkers. I'm playing chess. And in just a few hours, I will say, checkmate. It is finished. I want to give you four takeaways from the battle garden. Just an application. Four takeaways from the battle garden. Takeaway number one, connect the two battle gardens in the Bible. Connect the two battle gardens in the Bible. I I believe there's significance in the fact that Jesus retreated to a garden. He won a battle in the garden because he lost, because you lost a battle in the garden. So let's consider the two battle gardens, the garden of Eden and the garden of Gethsemane. Genesis 2 and 3 and then Luke 22. The Garden of Eden ruined us. It brought sin into the world. The Garden of Gethsemane saved us. Jesus would atone for the sins of the world. In the first garden, Adam said, Not your will, but mine be done. In the second garden, Jesus said, Not my will, but yours be done. In Eden, we find the first Adam. In Gethsemane, we find the second Adam. In Eden, Adam turned from God in the garden. In Gethsemane, God turned from Jesus in the garden. One garden brought us thorns. One garden brought us the crown of thorns. Before sin entered into the garden, the first man was naked and unashamed. In the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus Christ was stripped naked and bore our shame. By the first man... Sinning on a tree, it caused the second man to bear our sins on a tree. Scripture says you're either in Adam or you're in Christ. And there is no third category. So be found in Christ. What a wonderful Savior. Charles Gabriel says it like this. For me it was in the garden when he prayed, not my will but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for mine. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. See, connect the two battle gardens in the Bible because they point you to a garden where there will be no more battling. We have the Garden of Eden. We have the Garden of Gethsemane, but we also have the promise of a restored garden. In eternity, where there is no more battling. Takeaway number two. Connect the divine will with the human will. I'm going to dive deep. About 10,000 feet deep. How should we think of this relationship within the Trinity? Jesus said, Father, not my will, but yours be done. So did the Son have a different desire and will than the Father? Yes and no. There are two wills in Jesus, a human will and a divine will. Both are sinless. And there is a heresy that promotes just one will. That's not fully human or fully divine, but a blend of two wills. See, I define will as a spiritual capacity for desires and choice. So Jesus pleads to his father in his human will because he's motivated by his human desire to avoid wrath. The human will of Christ is praying, not my will, but yours be done. Remove the cup. But the divine will agreed in eternity past that he would drink the cup. And you have to admit that the way Jesus faced the garden is a little unusual. I would have not written it this way. I would have said Jesus went into the garden like a boss, pounding his chest, saying, bring it. Instead, he's crying, stop it. Those of you who are not Christians, you may say, that's why I don't follow your Christ, because he flinched in the bunker. Well, I want to prove to you that's why you should submit to this Christ, because of the flinch. See, the Greeks faced death cool and collected. Socrates died drinking hemlock and cracking jokes. The Romans were actually different than the Greeks. The Roman rulers died fearlessly and passionately yelling, bring the pain. Even some of Jesus' followers praised God while they were being sliced to pieces. The Maccabean martyrs spoke confidently about God as their arms and legs were cut off. 
Polycarp, an early Christian martyr, faced death. And, and they wanted to nail him to a stake. But he said, leave me as I am, for he that has granted me to endure the fire will grant me also to remain at the pile unmoved, even without the security of the nails which you seek. And as he burned, he prayed a prayer of thanks to God for being allowed to die a martyr. Not running from the fire, but knowing that the love of God kept him in the fire. My question to you is, in Gethsemane, do you hear Jesus saying, Come on, nails. Bring the spear. Pass the cup. No. Now, you're not going to like what I'm about to say next. How come almost all of Jesus' followers die better than him? Because he faced something Polycarp didn't face. It was beyond physical torment and death. That's flea bites in comparison. He is getting a foretaste of what's coming. God is beginning to turn away from the sun. Hence the flinch. Friends, that's why you should follow this Christ. Because of how horrible it is when the Father turns from you. Takeaway number three. Connect the descriptive garden with the prescriptive garden. Okay, let's come back up to ground and then go 10,000 feet in the air. Now we're just going to look at it from a helicopter viewpoint. I'm, I'm actually a little dis annoyed by how a lot of people preach this passage. I was reading three weeks ago when I was prepping for this sermon, and I'm reading manuscript after manuscript, commentary after commentary, and, and a lot of them were going like this. They were looking at the Garden of Gethsemane event, and they were saying, how can you get through your garden experience? It, they would title the things like, Escaping Your Gethsemane. And I just think that's wrong. I just think that's a wrong view of this text. Allow me to give an example and then to define some, some terms. A lot of people look at the book of Acts and they say, let's do church just like the book of Acts. But you have to understand that a lot of that book is descriptive, not prescriptive. Acts 28, for example, when Paul was bitten by a poisonous snake and he shook it off, the scripture is not saying whenever you're bitten by a snake, you shouldn't go to the hospital. Or if a dog, bite, if a dog bites you, you shouldn't get a tetanus shot. Acts 28 is descriptive, not prescriptive. So let me define the terms now. Descriptive is describing what happened. Prescriptive is prescribing how you should do it. Let me walk through those again. Descriptive is describing what happened. Prescriptive is prescribing how you should do it. So when you look at this passage and you reduce it to mimicking Jesus, prescriptive, you miss the point of Gethsemane. I ultimately do not believe that this passage is a to-do list on how you are to get through your Gethsemane. And there's a lot of, you know, they'd say a lot of helpful things. Like, you need to have prayer partners. Jesus had prayer partners. Eight outside the garden, three inside the garden. They'd say things like, realize that intimacy with God does not erase the potential of pain. Jesus went through pain. Both of those statements are true, but they're not true from this text. They're missing the point. I don't think this passage is about how you can make it through your Gethsemane. It's about what Jesus endured in the one and only Gethsemane for you. On your behalf. Rant over. <laughs> Takeaway number four. Last one. Connect the kiss of betrayal with the kiss of allegiance. We have a kiss of betrayal in the text. So connect the kiss of betrayal with the kiss of allegiance. Joshua Harris wrote a book entitled, I Kiss Dating Goodbye. It was the number one bestseller on almost every list. He sold like a million copies. It's an inspiring call to sincere love, real purity, and purposeful singleness. He asked in the book, are you tired of the, of the game? Going out, being dumped, waiting for a call that doesn't come? Have you tasted pain in dating? Drifting through one romance or possibly several of them? Have you ever wondered, is there a better way? In his book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye, it shows what it means to entrust your love life to God. Joshua Harris went on to pastor Covenant Life Church, a flagship Sovereign Grace Church, and was 
personally mentored by C.J. Mahaney. And this man who wrote the book on kissing, dating, goodbye to follow Christ, this week kissed Christ goodbye. He said, and I quote, I have undergone a massive shift in regard to my faith in Jesus. The popular phrase for this is deconstruction. The biblical phrase is falling away. By all the measurements that I have for defining a Christian, I am not a Christian. End quote. Some of you have kissed a lot of things goodbye to follow Christ. A very attractive person, but it wasn't God's person for you. A lucrative job offer that would pull you away from serving Christ in your local church. Family and friends who think you're nuts for following this guy who lived in the first century and basing your life on his teaching. You have sacrificed for Christ. And I would just remind you that so did Judas. He kissed his family goodbye. He kissed his job goodbye to follow a guy around for three years in the desert. You can kiss a lot of things goodbye, but eventually end up kissing Christ goodbye. Don't live on past kisses. Keep your walk with Christ fresh. Both Judas Iscariot and Joshua Harris kissed Christ goodbye. The question is, what will you do? Psalm 2 commands you to kiss the Son. A kiss of allegiance. I love that text. Kiss the Son lest he be angry. If you want to avoid the wrath of God, the anger of God, there's only one way, and that is to kiss the Son, to be in submission to His authority. When you pray on your knees, you kiss the Son. When you open the Word and it reads you, you kiss the Son. When you serve in the local church, you kiss the sun. When you give sacrificially, you kiss the sun. When you sing loudly to the glory of God, you kiss the sun. So let us give this sun the kiss.